first time ever in, in actually in I come from Brady, Brady, Germany.
if you want. If you want to Uh, Riz Ahmed. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Welcome. Uh, good morning. I hope you are on the, in the time, right time zone. Uh, so, welcome to the 11th Asia CCS, Computer uh, Conference on Communication Security. It's an honor to have you all here. Uh, that I'm standing in front of you is uh, a testimony to the incredible effort uh, of a whole lot of. Uh, can you hear now? Okay, good. A uh, whole lot of individuals, the steering committee, several of you are here. The program committee led by Ahmed, he'll talk a little bit of that, uh, some more of how it went. The general co chairs, Oscar, and uh, local arrangements chair, Huda and her team, and of course the NYU AD and uh, CCS AD team. If you're impressed with what you see here at NYU AD and CCS Abu Dhabi, let me acknowledge three people uh, who helped shape cybersecurity in NYU AD. Uh, the first two, one of them is not here, Nasser Memon, uh, some of you know, who is back in New York, uh, and Mushtaq from Georgia Tech, uh, thanks for their efforts. Uh, cybersecurity has become a gl world global scale effort here at NYU. Uh, CCS has a strong presence, 
uh, in the Middle East, and CCS Abu Dhabi, in NYU Abu Dhabi is our beachhead, and it helps us understand important cyber threats and offers a cultural perspective of the emerging cyber threats. Uh, if you enjoyed our hospitality, please let us know. If you see anything amiss, please come out to me or uh, talk to me. Uh, now let me introduce the third person that I alluded to, uh, our strongest backer and was first cheerleader, as I would call, Professor Fabio F Piano, Provost of NYU AD. I love the cheerleader part. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, and, and, and of course, welcome especially to those of you who have come here for the first time. I'm just curious, how many of you uh, have come to the UAE for the first time? Wow. Wow, that's incredible. Well, there you go. I think this is one of the uh, beautiful moments that we have here as starting a new university that we really provide an opportunity for all of us academics and otherwise to come together and, and see what's happening in this part of the world. So I really hope you take the time that you're here to also explore a little bit your surroundings, certainly in Moya Abu Dhabi, but also beyond, and see what is happening here in what is becoming, I think, increasingly an important and maybe a strategically really key part of the future of the world. And so I think we're very sort of in a sense, lucky uh, to be here. And I want to tell you just a, a, really a couple of minutes about what NY Abu Dhabi is, um, so that at least you have a little bit of a sense. Um, and, and then to sort of get you going with your conference. So one thing that you should know about NY Abu Dhabi is that, of course, it's, it's a kind of a new adventure, a venture, which is between the government of Abu Dhabi and NYU. NYU is, in fact, the largest private university in the United States and decided with the government of Abu Dhabi to start a new institution, not a study of wayside, not a, not a kind of a, a, a little bit of a, of a program outside of the United States, but a full flat, full idea university, which now has over 22 undergraduate majors across uh, all disciplines, science, engineering, art, humanities, and social science. Uh, we've opened the doors in 2010, which means that in 2014, we graduated our first undergraduate students. And we've gone all over the world to identify what we think are among the best students one can find around the world. So one of the, one of the concepts that brought us here was really that if you really have an opportunity of starting a new university, at really the new millennium, in a really important region of the world, how would you do it? And so it enabled us to ask these questions back in New York, even a couple of years before we opened the doors here. And one of the things that we realized very quickly is that this country is, got to, is, is a really welcoming place for us to imagine what is really the future of the world in the sense of a globalizing society. So I think we all recognize, and the social scientists tell us, that this is, in fact, the most transformative moment in our history as humans, uh, going from a much more local national environment to becoming much more of a global environment. So we were able to think about NYU Abu Dhabi now as a new institution that is geared towards a society that is developing now. And what we see is, in fact, the, the, the possible trajectories of that society. And you are among the leading areas that I think um, can really show the way because clearly in the cyber world, the global society is already there. But in the physical world, uh, we really have a lot of work to do. And in fact, this region also is a region where we see the perils as well as the potential for a globalizing society. We see that when people of different cultures and different nationality and different religion might actually uh, come together and uh, there are political ways in which one can use the differences um, to highlight them. Whereas, in fact, as humans, we all recognize that by far the majority of our essence is shared among all humans. So in what way does a university take on the responsibility, which I think is the only place in our society that you can build this on, uh, of how to build a harmonious and a more just globalizing society? And I think that's the message that has, in fact, been extremely powerful to attract amazing young uh, students to NYU Abu Dhabi. So this year, we'll be graduating our fourth class. 
And um, the students come from all over the world. In fact, more than 110 nationalities represented in our undergraduate student body. Uh, there is no nationality. There is more than 15%, and that's uh, actually the nationality of the UAE. So in fact, if you think about it that way, there is no dominant voice in the undergraduate student population. So all the different nationalities interact with each other essentially as equals. And that's a really important element of how the students are learning about this. So this message has enabled us to be very successful in recruiting top students. So we now have more than 95% rejection rate. And if you think about something that universities in the US think about a lot is the yield rate. Yield rate is, of course, how many students come that you make an offer to. And to give you uh, examples, um, you know, Yale, Princeton, uh, Stanford, they've always been in the 70s percent, percent uh, of success for yield rate. And uh, when they got to 79, Stanford made big news. It was historic. Um, Harvard is around 80 percent. And, and we've never been below 81 percent. So our yield rate is, is essentially at the top. Our students, of course, coming from all over the world, are very studious. And so they've, they graduate uh, in four years at about more than 90%. And about a third of them continue to go to graduate school. And our student population, because it comes from such, I'll give you just two examples. Um, uh, one of the ways in which undergraduate education measures its success is in a particular scholarship called the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, and the Rhodes Scholarship is among the, the most prestigious ones for undergraduates to get. And in the history of Rhodes Scholarship, uh, NYU had seven. Uh, and it's a large university, and in, in the first four uh, graduating classes, which is about 500 or more, a little more students, we had eight. So we more than doubled the history of Rhodes Scholarships for NYU since being here. And in addition, final example, um, one of our first graduates in the first class, a, a UAE national, became the youngest minister in the world, actually here in the UAE. So it's an, an incredible um, opportunity for young people to come together and see a hopeful version of what could happen if we all get together. And I spent a little bit of time on this because, of course, you are in an area that has both the positive and the real danger. Uh, technology has fueled the transformation of our society uh, from, in fact, industrial revolution, and it's now really fueling this globalization. And so in some ways, I would love to um, sort of make you think uh, in ways that are beyond your technical expertise and being uh, almost challenging you to think of the responsibility that you hold. You hold the responsibility, in fact, not only to uh, work out these fascinating areas that really lead us to, to have a secure environment uh, in the cyber environment and to have a way that we can progress utilizing, of course, all the amazing technology that enables the progress of, of the world, but at the same time to lead us into thinking about how we can manage that in the most positive way possible. And perhaps not giving up on just um, thinking that it's such an easy technology now that anyone can become a hacker you know, in a sort of negative sense as well as in a positive sense, but actually to think about how we go from a society that clearly, because of the technology, information is no longer the distingu distinguishing piece between successful people and less successful people. And neither is knowledge. I think with um, progress in deep learning, AI in general, uh, and big data, uh, knowledge systems are becoming a lot more powerful. So what's next? What's next is, I think, uh, human judgment and the ability to go from information, knowledge, and judgment into what we've always valued as human beings, which is wisdom. And so in a way, we want to be here providing that kind of energy uh, for the future. And I look to you, uh, to challenge you, to give us the path in your area to, to be doing that, because I think it's one of the key areas for the future of the world. So with that, I really wish you a fantastic conference of open exchange. And I hope you take the time to enjoy uh, NYU Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to Asia CCS uh, 17 in Abu Dhabi. My name is Osgur Sianoglu. Uh, I'm with NYU Abu Dhabi. I'm also the general chair of this conference. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Fabio for the uh, great welcome remarks. 
uh, this always makes us uh, proud to be part of this university. Um, I'd like to also thank the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute for hosting this event. Um, uh, also, I'd like to thank our strategic partner, uh, Dubai Electronic Security Center, um, for their generous contribution. Um, we are also other sponsors, uh, Center for Cybersecurity for the logistic uh, support, ACM, ACM ZigZag, and uh, Huawei. We're all thankful for the um, various contributions of these entities. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Marwan al uh for brief remarks. Uh, Dr. Marwan is the Director of Information Services in uh, Dubai Electronic Security Center. And uh, Dr. Marwan. And also, Dubai Electronic Security Center is a strategic partner of, of HSECS 2017. Hello, everyone, and um, I would like to just start with a very short story about my, uh, how I knew about ACM. So basically, I was studying in uh, mid-90s uh, in the U.S., and uh, I was in a military kind of school, um, and I was studying aviation computer science. And then I saw a poster saying ACM, and I didn't know what ACM was at the time. And it just said, free pizza night tonight. On a Friday night, free pizza and drinks. And then it had some weird things like HTML and internet. I didn't know what those phrases meant at all. So I was like, okay, free pizza, free drinks. I was a student, so why not? <laughs> so that's how I knew about the internet and coding HTML, and it changed my life, changed my career, thanks to a very small gathering with people, you know, like-minded people, and uh, this is how... Uh, you know, technology and even career changes. So I encourage you to talk to each other, use this opportunity to learn about things that are, you know, out of your comfort zone. Don't stick to your, you know, areas of expertise. Try to get exposed to the other areas. I know we are in the internet age, but uh, personal relationships are, and personal, uh, you know, meetings are very important. So with that said, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, um, Center, which is uh, Dubai's uh, information security uh, uh, center for you know making sure all government organizations in Dubai are up to the standard when it comes to security, and also introduce the government departments to the new technology and the technology trends such as IoT, um, blockchain technologies, uh, threat intelligence, and other technologies like that. So. Uh, uh, we also sponsor research, uh, we sponsor events like this uh, to bring this um, knowledge and bring this space where people can meet physically and interchange uh, knowledge and, and, and share um, uh, their expertise and their enthusiasm uh, with others. So with that said, I welcome you all and thank you for the organizing, uh, organizing committee and also our invited speakers and that's what we want to see here. Invited speakers coming here creating that momentum, creating interest in these areas that they are experts in and bringing their excitement to these kinds of uh, conferences. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, as you may know, organizing a conference uh, requires a lot of work. Um, for this, you need a team of great people working in harmony, and Ramesh and I have been very fortunate to have the best team. So on the technical side, uh, Ahmed Reza Sadagi and Shun, Shun Yi, uh, together they put together a uh, high quality program, uh, which made us work extra hard uh, on the social aspects to match that, that quality level. But with uh, Hoda and Nora, our local arrangement chair and coordinator, and the researchers of uh, Cyber, uh, Center for Cybersecurity who worked as uh, volunteers for this event, we think um, we were able to deliver a good uh, social program. We'll talk about that. Uh, they worked really um, day and night for the last couple of weeks tirelessly, so we appreciate all the, all the effort. Um, so throughout the conference, if you have any questions, if you need any help, you'll be able to locate our volunteers um, by the black Asia CCS uh, 17 organizing committee, organizing uh, shirts. So they'll be uh, wearing the same shirt throughout the conference. Uh, well, hopefully not the same shirt throughout the conference, <laughs> but uh, you understand what I'm saying. So they'll be easy to locate. So um, we've also had great web presence. Uh, 
um, everything was up to date. All the information was there thanks to our web chairs, Tommaso um, and JV. Um, we also thank our publication chair, Mihalis Maniatakos, making sure that um, all the papers made it to proceedings, and our registration chair, Christina, uh, for making sure that everybody paid for their registration. Thank you, Christina. That was important. So um, we also have, uh, we've tried interesting things in terms of uh, screening uh, papers for quality, and we'll talk more about that, but let me acknowledge at this point the shadow, shadow PC chairs, Will and Long. Uh, this was something very interesting, and we're proud of it. Um, let me also thank workshop chairs, Ernesto and Kapil, uh, publicity chairs, Mauro and Debin, and poster chairs, um, Luca and Alexandra. Um, so here on this slide, I show a list of the steering committee members from two years ago. So it's outdated, but it's, we, we show that uh, intentionally. The reason is, this is the steering committee that basically trusted us uh, to organize Asia CCS 2017 in Abu Dhabi. So we'd like to thank them for their uh, trust and support, and we're hoping that they'll feel that we didn't let them down after the, after the event. So let me briefly invite uh, Jian Ying and Robert to the podium, uh, because changes are happening in steering committee, and they would like to appreciate the services of uh, Robert Dan, the current chair of the steering committee. So from the new chair to the old chair. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Ahmed, for reminding us the, about the important picture. That's, so in case you're wondering the composition of uh, the people in this room, uh, here's a breakdown of uh, registrations or attendees by region. We have the biggest attendance from Middle East, mostly, mostly UAE and Abu Dhabi, about one third. And uh, it's, it's followed by Europe, Asia, and uh, North America. So this is, this is a great picture to see because we see that people are coming from all over the world to this event, and we'd like to thank you for that, for traveling long distance uh, to be a part of this, this uh, event one way or another. Um, this is something difficult to read for you, but you're not meant to read the details here. It just shows you how packed the program is. So we have a great program, and Ahmed will give you more details about this program. I'm here to give you, just talk a little bit about the logistics. So uh, this room is a lecture hall, it's 007, and all the keynotes, invited talks, and the tutorials will be given in this room, except for the public lecture talk, uh, which is one of the keynotes of this conference by Professor Ross Anderson. It's going to be in the auditorium right across the corridor. Uh, so that's going to be at 6.30 tonight, and right after that, there's going to be a nice reception. Uh, so, uh, and we're calling it public lecture because we decided this, we're following the NYU tradition of public lectures. We're opening up that talk to the public uh, for public attendance in addition to your attendance as well. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Hoda Saimi. She is the director of the Center for Cybersecurity here at NYU Abu Dhabi, and she is the brains and muscles behind all the logistics and operations. So she'll give a few remarks Thank about you, the Oscar. social program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Oscar, and uh, all the committees in Asia CCS 2017 for bringing such a rich, uh, intensive uh, event to uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, I would like to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sabah al khair. So you get to hear a bit of Arabic in UAE. We didn't want you to come here to UAE and then get out of UAE without seeing any of uh, UAE culture. So we tried to also organize a rich social program for you. But before going through the details of the program, I wanted to tell you that you are in a country that's very young. Uh, UAE is 45 years old. 
and uh, it took UAE a huge effort to jump the steps and accelerate the programs we've been discussing with Dr. Marwan, how Dubai having uh, 10x committees and 10x programs, that's to speed up projects that would initially take 10 years to be, uh, to be uh, implemented and constructed to make sure that they are constructed and implemented within one year or two years or maybe in months. One year, there is a restriction to, uh, you know, bring them to fruition in one year. So um, seeing that, it's about unity through diversity and UA is all about diversity. It's not about uh, oil economy. I just wanted you to know that uh, oil economy is only 28% of the national economy. The rest of the economy, the 70-something uh, percent, is all about uh, the different fields you're going to see uh, in the background. Saying that, we'll take you around the city in a tour so you see the different, uh, the, the different uh, landmarks in Abu Dhabi. We're taking you to, Sa to Sadiyat Island, main uh, Manarat Sadiyat, and then we're taking you as well to the Souk, uh, the Corniche, uh, Emirates Palace, and the Grand Mosque. And in addition to this, you will see bits and pieces around the city about, in, of, um, about different traditional uh, events as well. Uh, if you are interested to be part of this tour, don't forget that you have to be on the bus. The big bus company will be outside A6 at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. So 2 p.m. to uh, 9 p.m. Free your calendar. We're gonna we are going to take you to the city tour and then to a local dinner in an Amarati restaurant in Ritz Carlton that's called Al Fanar. If you are interested in buying an extra ticket, you can have this extra ticket by the desk. We have a surprise for you, and we kept it a bit. We try to we try to keep it to keep, to keep it a secret as much as possible. We could not, obviously. Uh, so the attendees of the conference will have the international attendees of the conferences will have a choice to have either Ferrari tickets or a performance ticket to one of the musical performances happening on campus. Uh, you can collect your tickets by the registration desk. This is strictly for uh, the uh, Ferrari tickets are prioritized to be for the international audience, for AJCCS, international registered audience. And uh, you can collect your ticket by the registration desk. Um, uh, we have choices between Wednesday and uh, Thursday. Uh, the tickets will be valid either on Wednesday or on Thursday. Uh, there are a few buses that go from the Welcome Center. You do have the bus schedule where you can go uh, on your own. You check the bus schedule and you go on your own there to Yasmo, and it's located on Yasmo. Um, so, yes, I hope this will bring a bit of joy. <laughs> Everybody gets a Ferrari? Or... Uh, <laughs> probably in the next conference, maybe we'll work on this. <laughs> So I'll, I'll turn the mic back to Oscar. Thank you very much. So just a few reminders, uh, you know, bus schedule from hotels and to hotels, please uh, make sure they're all uh, on the website. Uh, you heard about the social event. And if you need attendance certificates, you can get them by the registration desk. They'll be available for you on Tuesday. So at this point, I'd like to turn the podium over to our great uh, program chair, Ahmed, who, who's going to brag a little bit rightfully about the program. <laughs> Not my style. <laughs> so sorry that we have to change. I don't trust any other computer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And... Uh, that's why I'm doing this. Yes, what shall I do? I also trust Intel CPU. Uh, okay. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. No, it's not working. So we need.
Okay, sorry. So, welcome to AGSCCS 2017. Uh, I think that was said several times before. Uh, I am very surprised that many of you came, uh, especially from four, four countries. Uh, this is a new experience with um, um, Abu Dhabi uh, because it is part of Asia. It's a young uh, part of a young region, a very open region, uh, very much... Uh, sophisticated region, you can see on the style of eating, on the style of uh, hotels and all other things. Um, and it's also an open region. So that's very interesting that we have so many, we expected to have a, a number of uh, participants from uh, Europe, but that's an experiment that until now is working uh, very well. So I would like to say something about the general security uh, aspects. And 2016, was a very depressive year, especially when you are doing a, a chair of a conference. I was very depressed because you have, you know, this, I just put some of the news that uh, there was a fishing trends report on fishing. We are, we are looking into fishing for many, many years, but in practice, uh, not much, much uh, has changed. Um, but also uh, uh, the Mirai uh, attack, one of the uh, biggest internet distributed denial of service attacks, uh, with IoT devices, we are talking about IoT, but most of the IoT devices have uh, actually practically zero security. And that's a bit sad, having so, so many beautiful papers at so many conferences, including Asia CCS. Um, so that was uh, just some of the news. And then something that uh, for me was a big depression that will influence cybersecurity in any region of this world is this one. <laughs> so, I'm sorry for our U.S. participants. I know most of you. Uh, this, these are two countries that I truly love, especially U.S. I have a big connection to U.S. and things are changing. We hope that these things will some, someday go to the better, but for cybersecurity, this will have consequences. Either a very negative one that I'm just proposing, that's suggesting that this will be very negative, or it has a positive things. And especially the research that is going to come up, it shows that all the machine learning uh, um, uh, effort has failed to, uh, to predict things like, like elections. And this is a research that I call adversarial machine learning. And uh, you can uh, see it how, how all these uh, estimations on an election uh, were wrong. So we have a kind of different way of thinking about the world and how the conferences are going to be, uh, uh, are, are going to be take, taking place all over the world. Are they going to be U.S.? The most important security conferences are in U.S., which is, which is good. We go to U.S., but now it's getting very difficult uh, for many people to get to US, U.S. And so there are other options that uh, this community should think about it uh, if there is still a problem to go to US. We have a different view of the world now. Uh, and, and so I see a, a, a big motivation uh, from many, many uh, colleagues uh, around the world to, uh, to just, uh, you know, to bid for, for, for a conference like, for example, Asia CCS or even bigger conferences like uh, CCS or even IEEE Security and Privacy. So let me, uh, now uh, jokes are over, uh, let us look into the uh, real review process of, of uh, Asia CCS. So we had uh, 359 submitted papers, 71 were accepted as regular paper or long paper papers. Uh, originally six papers were accepted as short papers because the program uh, uh, committee thought that these papers are still interesting. Uh, they wanted to see it in the program, and two of the two of uh, papers they denied to be uh, short papers. They wanted to be a regular paper, uh, and we said, "Okay, we are sorry. PC has decided like this. It was not only my decision." Uh, program committee, we had 108 members. Uh, we had around uh, more than 1,000 uh, reviews uh, that were sending over the system and the discussion uh, messages. There were nearly 2,000. 
We had a shadow PC that uh, William Eng is going to explain uh, why we had shadow PC, what were the advantages and the, the disadvantages of, of having a shadow PC. This was a, the first experiment that we did. If you know from all other conferences, we have rebattle phase, which I think is a psychological nonsense, to be uh, honest to you. We have appeal from uh, IEEE security privacy. I don't know who thought about this concept of appeal, because even it is more nonsense than rebuttal. We had shadow pieces uh, where uh, young researchers or PhD students were put as a kind of parallel PC to review the papers, but they didn't have any influence on the acceptance or rejection of the papers. And this shadow PC had a big influence on what papers sometimes were accepted or not. And I think Will is going to talk about that in more detail. So, uh, you don't have to read it, program committee, we are very thankful for, for their uh, work. Uh, some of them, they had to uh, experience my impatience in when they were late. I sent them a bad email, some of them were not happy. Uh, I'm sorry if you are here, we can, I can just uh, spend you a drink. But uh, in general, you should uh, send your reviews on time, and that's the rule, yeah. Uh, Shadow program, uh, many of these, uh, these younger researchers, they're also mixed with some senior researchers to take care of younger researchers who are enthusiastic and say, this, has not so many, this paper has not so many details, it's, it's uh, not a good paper. And then uh, the uh, senior guys should calm them down, know this paper has, has uh, uh, some merit. This was the reason for that. So we have, uh, I just put these things because this is the, I think this is important for, for people who did a lot of work. Um, and fastest PC reviewers, I mean the first one, and I don't know how it can happen because uh, he was even finished before we set up the system. Uh, <laughs> that was Matthias Payer who is sitting there and is uh, smiling and making pictures from me, hopefully, and uh, this, yeah, okay. Um, then it was Conrad from uh, uh, Technical University Braunschweig, he was also after you, so we have a very nice statistic, nice pictures that Tommaso made. I didn't put it here because it takes time. So these are really fast uh, uh, reviews. And of course, you may ask, okay, fast review doesn't matter. You can write that a one uh, line review, but they had a quality review as well. So this, we checked that of course. And um, then best PC reviewers from the view of the shadow PC members, because shadow PC members evaluated the reviews of the PC members. Yeah. So this is an internal thing. So if you want to ask somebody to be in your program committee, ask me because I know who was good, who was not good. Yeah? I don't, of course, reveal the names here because of privacy reasons, but under four or eight eyes, I can talk to more. Yeah? So these are people who were uh, evaluated. Their reviews were extremely detailed. Uh, and careful, so I put top 10, and I think, uh, um, and, and one, what you should take, think about it is that not everybody got many papers, so uh, PC members got uh, in average seven papers, and non-PC uh, members uh, as well, and, and some people were both in PC and in the shadow PC, so they got more papers. So uh, it's also important to see how many papers they had to, uh, so. The fastest uh, shadow PC reviewers uh, are these uh, five. Uh, Emiliano de Cristofaro from UCL, he was extremely uh, fast. Sorry, Matthias, you are not in the shadow PC. Um, submitted papers by country. Um, as you see, as always, US is the most active one because they, they is also a bigger country and they have many security groups, uh, many strong security groups. Then, uh, from the submission uh, point of view, uh, China, I think it's obvious, they have so many people, yeah. Um, then, and most of them are doing security currently. Um, Germany, so they are, there are many big, uh, so German government has, has pushed a lot of money into, into uh, cyber security, and they are not very afraid, uh, uh, you know, of... Uh, Russian hackers to influence the election, so they are putting more money into. Uh, so if you want, if if you want to uh, have a 
faculty position in Germany, just talk to me. Yeah. Okay. And, and then we have uh, uh, Singapore and, and many, many other uh, countries. And interestingly, at, at, the, at the end, you see that uh, there are countries that I didn't think that they sent papers, but they sent, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, accepted papers by country. That was a submission. That accepted papers by country. Again, U.S. is number one. Singapore is number two. And that's, uh, of course, Singapore is Asia. You can say they can fly here. Singapore airline, beautiful airline. Why not? But, um, and they have some money to pay for students. Uh, but indeed, as a small country, uh, they are contributing a lot. Also international, not only Asia CCS, but also on other established security conferences. So thanks to Singapore. And then we have Germany and others. So China must improve. Yeah, OK. Shadow program committee members by country, I think this may not be interesting, but it is, uh, we just try to make it uh, <laughs> kind of uniform, but it was not possible because every PC member was, was subject to discussion should we take this PC member or not? Yeah. Um, and some, of course, uh, didn't want to because they were very busy. Paper decisions. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, um, a lot, lots of rejections. We had uh, 67 papers accepted, a regular paper, and uh, six uh, short papers. So it will be 18% uh, acceptance rate. So these are, this is a kind of distribution of reject, weak reject, weak accept, accept, and strong accept. For, for the rejected papers, as you see, most uh, PC members, they just gave weak reject. That is a policy that many PC members have. So weak reject, you can make it to weak accept or reject. And as you see on the other, the green one, this is the policy that uh, also most... Uh, PC members take this a political correctness that you give to every paper first, we can accept every paper that you like, yeah? Um, if you're not completely sure. And then in discussion, of course, we had papers that had several <laughs> we can accept, but we still rejected the paper because they were huge discussion about the paper. And we considered then the shadow PC uh, as the last hammer for acceptance and rejection. We have a, a number of invited talks and keynotes. Uh, so we have three keynotes. Uh, a bit later, we will start with, with Christoph Paul. I will introduce him because uh, I know him for some time, but I think he's a known name. I don't have to uh, uh, introduce him much. Then we have Ross Anderson, I think. Master Anderson, everybody knows him. Um, we have a very, very, very honored that actually uh, uh, Greg, uh, Eckers from um, uh, Cisco. I didn't expect, Greg, that you come uh, because you are a very, very busy man. I have heard it from all other Cisco collaborators I have, but I am extremely delighted that you came, uh, not only me, but also organizers. And some of them, they said, really, he comes? Said, yes, yes, he's coming. So um, thank you very much. Um, then we have uh, six invited talks uh, from uh, different parts of the world. Um, some of them are from Brexit, like, like Ivan. <laughs> some of them are from some part of Europe that still don't, doesn't want to be Europe. And uh, the other one is the new imperial <laughs> so, United States. And, um, and we have David Nakash, who is uh, actually, uh, um, he is giving a talk on behalf of uh, Huawei, our sponsor, thank you very much. Huawei products are very nice, and please buy them. And, uh, <laughs> and they, will, they will definitely give us uh, lots of uh, sponsorship next time, even more than this time. So, and uh, we have, we just chose the kind of uh, senior uh, and uh, junior um, uh, invited talks. So you have lots of options to choose, and they are, they are running in parallel. We have... Uh, tutorials uh, on different topics from post-quantum cryptography. I'm happy that Johannes Buchmann accepted my invitation to come here and give a tutorial on that, to uh, smart contracts and bitcoins and uh, remote attestation. That would be very interesting tutorials for those. 
Now I will give uh, to, uh, the stage to Bill to talk about our shadows. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. So uh, Long Lu and I uh, ran the, the Shadow PC. And so uh, as, as Ahmad alluded, we had something a little different in mind than your, your typical Shadow PC, which is geared towards really a purely educational experience. It happens in parallel to the main PC. And you kind of look at the results and say, ah, oh, look, this is uh, some, some rough numbers of how they correlated. And so we wanted with something where the Shadow PC had a real impact on the conference program itself. And, and one of the things that we wanted to try to address with this was this problem is you've all got, you've gotten reviews back. Is it, who wrote that review? It was very short, right? I wanted, I wanted more assessment to my, to my paper itself. And we said, well, what if we use the shadow PC to help provide some sanity checking on the reviews themselves? Because we get more and more papers where we have 359 papers, multiply that by three or four to the number of reviews we had to have, right? Even for, for chairs, as, as, as little sleep as they, as they get, to go through all of those, those papers is a big effort. So let's get some more eyes on these, these reviews. And so um, I've been on program committees where there are these uh, review task forces. I don't know if you've, you've seen these before, where there are some members of the PC get a reduced load in the number of papers they have to review, and they go through and they provide some assessment of the different reviews. And in my experience, I, I found that maybe it's just the selection of, of review task for people who've reviewed my reviews, but they really aren't looking at the reviews. And so we want it with something where someone who's doing this assessment of the reviews actually is an understanding of the paper itself, right? So you can really quickly identify a review that is short or vague, but to go into that review and say, they're missing the main point of this paper, right? You need someone who's read that paper, maybe tried to write a review itself. And so we wanted the, the, the SPC doing this to actually have read the paper and, and thought carefully about it as well. Now, in this process, we're getting an assessment on reviews. Some of these PC members are senior people in the field, and we want to incorporate some junior folk into this process. And so you don't necessarily want a junior folk telling some very senior person, yeah, that's a really crappy review. We don't want that feedback to go back. So we, we wanted to be able to have some anonymity to this process. Um, we did it in both, both, both aspects. We did a, a double, double blind process, um, and, and maybe in the future, could probably be reduce the, the, the double lines to single blindness, and we'll, I'll get to that in a, a little bit. So um, to do this, we had a junior, junior folks, we had some senior folks. We did some normalization so that if you were on both the PC and the SPC, you didn't have 50% more papers to review. We tried to, to keep that, that uh, uh, normalized. Um, and then it came the hard part. How do we actually pull this off? Now, there's no good software out there to allow a reviewer of a paper to not know the names of all the other reviewers for at least some sub part of that. Um, so we, we put together some systems and, I, and a big thanks goes out to Tommaso who's sitting down here who, who actually made all of this happen and work. And so we had two instances of hot CRP, um, some, some scripts kind of tying some things together um, and then uh, a big manual effort by, by Long and myself of sort of getting in these, getting these assessments uh, from, the, from the SPC members getting the, that feedback back to the reviewers about those papers. So did this work? This was a big experiment. Uh, I think broad strokes was very effective. We had a number of cases where PC reviewers said, hey, thanks, yeah, I didn't understand that piece of the paper. This SPC member provided me some insight here that I didn't understand. Yeah, this is actually a really cool, cool aspect that maybe I should tone back my, my negativity there. Um, so this was a, a really big positive that happened on a number of case, occasions. We also think that there was this sort of implicit threat that someone was reading your reviews that, that PC members themselves did uh, a bit more thorough job in reviewing their papers. Um, also, as we mentioned, the, the SPC reviews uh, turned out to be pretty critical and in the end in, in, in sort of accepting and rejecting papers. Um, in many cases, we, in quite really in all cases, we were able to copy those reviews over so the main PC could see those reviews. Um, and in some cases, not every PC member submitted their reviews by the time we needed to make decisions, and it was really critical to have these, these additional experts on these papers. Um, so those are the big positive sides. There were some, some negative sides to this. Um, we didn't get as much of an educational experience out of the, the shadow PC as we originally hoped. And a big, of this, a big part of this was the, the, the software we were working with. We tried to have this anonymity to protect the, the shadow PC members 
but that limited the way that they could actually interact with the, the main PC members. And on a number of occasions, Long and I were copy and pasting messages from the comments fields of one system to the other to try to mediate this conversation and provide that anonymity layer. And that just didn't scale very well. Yeah. So maybe we need to enhance, enhance these, these systems. So it was an enormous effort. Uh, I think a successful experiment. Um, if we do this in the future, I think you know, making that software work a little more, uh, uh, more fluidly, I, I think is something we could, we could really use. So I'll hand it back over to, to Ahmed, or do I just flip the slide here? I'll flip the slide. All right. So, Christoph, you have your own, own computer? No, no. It's here. No? It's on this computer. You're using Mac? Yeah. So the, the next, uh, sorry for, for a bit uh, delay, uh, the next uh, speaker, was like our, key, our first keynote is Christoph Parr. I think those of you who have been uh, doing hardware security or embedded security must actually know him. You want to say something? Or? No, no, I okay. just click on the link. No, okay. Yeah. Uh, I know Christoph for, for many, many years. Um, I remember that the first uh, time Christoph even wanted to hire me in, in, as he was uh, assistant professor at uh, WPI in, in, in US. And uh, somehow I got another um, offer with more money. So I said, no, thank you. But I, I really uh, learned a lot from Christoph uh, Parr. He was a kind of uh, one of the first me mentor uh, for me. Um, so he, he was, he's one of the co-founders of, of CHESS, uh, the, the embedded security and hardware security uh, conference that is extremely popular now. Uh, he has been working in automotive industry uh, and, and consulting them, uh, making a company, the company, making the company great. And um, so, I don't really need to uh, explain much more on that. I'll just give the stage to Christoph Parr for, for his uh, talk. Thank you very much. So, yeah, um, thanks for this. It's always extremely kind introduction by Ahmad. And uh, thanks for inviting me. It's really a pleasure being here. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from rainy Germany, where the weather is quite different from Abu Dhabi. So it's, it's great being here. Um, what I want to talk about uh, is really an um, area that my research has focused on over the last few years, and I think it's, it's total fun to work on that, namely the uh, general era, area of hardware trojans, so hardware manipulations. Um, and um, you know, I've been successful with getting grant money for that, so this is, uh, this is really good. Does this work here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't really need it, yeah. So, yeah, so if, if German professors do great thing, it's not the German professors, right? It's the graduate students and postdocs, like Georg Pavel and Marx. A lot of, a lot of the results I'm, I'm going to present were, were done by these three gentlemen here. So, um, what I want to uh, do today, first I want to give you an introduction about hardware trojans. And then, you know, topics two, three, and four, these are kind of the three technical content areas of today. Subtransistor, ASIC trojans, whatever that is. FPGA trojan and key extraction attacks. Um, so first I want to give you like a, a brief introduction about hardware trojans. Um, they're pretty self-explaining, right? So I have, have a hardware chip on the left and then I do some kind of malicious manipulation to it or manipulation that at turns uh, um, results in an uh, unwanted uh, functionality of the chip, you know, something that's the original um, owner didn't intend to. So the so question is, why would anybody do that? Well, there are many applications, right? There was a, particularly in the, the um, US, there was a, a big driving force from that coming from the DOD, the Department of Defense. So they are afraid that the chips are being manipulated. Um, also in the US, but also in Europe, probably all over the world, critical infrastructure. You know, they, we, we heard the term IoT already five times this morning, right? 
IoT by definition relies on digital chips, right? This is the intelligence, right? Communication, computation. So what happens if, you know, somebody controls all the ASICs that run our critical infrastructure, but also consumer electronics, personal devices, and so forth. You know, there are many reasons why bad guys would be interested in manipulating our hardware. Maybe a little bit um, historical view on that. Um, I started doing crypto hardware in 1995, so a long, long time ago. And my first NSF career grant was on F crypto FPGAs, but I never heard the term tro hardware Trojan. It was really interesting including myself, you know, I never really thought about working on that. And then in February 2005, it's hard to read here, the, the, the um, Defense Science Board, it's part of the US DOD, came up with this report on high-performance microchip supply. So they were worried that, you know, when we manufacture our chips uh, um, abroad, internationally, we get chips back that don't have the intended functionality on board, right? So, and what you see here is, you know, prior to 2007, there was essentially nobody working on that. So this is just a paper count, right? Scientific papers, either the, the blue line where the, the uh, actually in the title, it, it talks about malicious hardware and the red uh, line is, is paper that don't have it in the title, but they still deal with them. So it really grew up and, uh, you know, it really grew triggered by this single um, report by the Department of Defense and they put a lot of money behind it. So um, let's see what are the settings, what are the attacker settings at worst three scenarios, I guess, right? Um, so the first one I mentioned before is this manufacturing, right? The, the vast majority of, of chip of IC companies don't manufacture the chips anymore, right? The vast majority of chip companies are what, what they call fabless, right? So they are only a, a few fabs left. And the, the latest, the, the former IBM, lab in upstate New York um, that's being built now is, 10, no, is $1 billion. So it's pretty pricey. So there aren't that many companies left that keep, you know, that, that, that maintain the state of art facility and this trend is going to continue. So there will be fewer and fewer chip manufacturers. Um, another big uh, uh, problem is design manipulation by third party IP cards. What is it? If you open your iPhone and there's one big main chip, right, but this is the, the IP on that, so the software, if you wish, the functionality is not written only by Apple. There are more than 100 so-called IP courses, so more than 100 different hardware blocks that are written by some other company, like your MP3 decoder here, for instance, right, or your AS engine. Um, another attack could happen during shipment of devices or maybe built-in by the manufacturer himself or herself, right? So what is interesting, I think, kind of historically looking at the last 10 years, how this, this area of hardware trojans uh, came into existence, this is what the DOD was worried about, right? They said either, you know, malicious manufacturer or malicious IP cost, right? We have to be really worried about. And there's some discussion whether this is really a problem. There's some very senior people say this is, is very far-fetched, right? It's not clear that this is ever going to happen. What we do know since 2013, that these two attacks, which are not, which are not performed by malicious manufacturer, but by you know, uh, government agencies themselves, are very likely. And there's at least one documented case where a keyboard got, um, uh, during shipment, got interdicted. And as, as we know from the Spiegel re re revelations on the Edward Snowden files, there's even NSA term for that. It's called interdiction. So, during shipment of an electronic device, you know, they, they intercept your UPS package, open your PC and put some malicious chip in it. So that, that this is real. What I wanted to show with these slides is there are many reasons where people may want to, or how, the many, many ways how people can um, manipulate your hardware, right? So um, that's kind of state of the art here. That's an observation, right? So now the question is, is this really a um, topic of concern? And you all know that I'm, going to, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear many talks about this in the, in the next three days here on hardware Trojans, right? on, uh, on, on, not on Trojans, on malware in the software case, right? And there's these crazy numbers, which are always hard for me to believe as a hardware guy, right? They're whatever, 10,000 new malware vi viruses coming up per day. 
In the hardware case, it's totally different. There has, been, there has not been a single confirmed case of a real hardware trojan, right? So we know it's a big potential threat. We don't really know how they're going to look, right? So this is kind of a, which I think we as a, as a, as a hardware security community that we're fighting against, right? We don't really know how they look. Um, there are plenty of examples, but there are people like me doing that, right? Or a mesh, right? We're coming up with the Trojans. Is this how the German government would introduce a Trojan into your PC or iPhone? I don't know, right? So, and there are many publications on that, and, um, but they're almost, fo almost all focused on detection of hardware Trojans. Again, we don't really know how hardware Trojans might look, realistic hardware Trojans. So it's kind of a little bit of a problem. That's how motivation for our work, Georg and I. So we thought, couldn't we look into designing Trojans? And uh, what you will, you know, once you start working on that, just planning, uh, uh, just designing plain old hardware Trojans is pretty easy. You know, plain old Trojan would be you have an AS core on your smartphone chip or whatever. And with it, you know, when you send a certain code word, a certain input parameter, you leak the key. This is pretty easy to do, right? It's a few lines of, of um, HDL code, right? So we had this additional uh, um, condition that we imposed on ourselves. Trojans are really hard to detect. Okay, so and let's see what you, and what we, what, what, how we defined hard to detect. So we wanted to, to do the smallest possible alteration to the chip. So not put a big comparator on that and, you know, key leakage unit. Do something really, really tiny. And so we start at like a almost atomic element of, of modern uh, digital circuits, namely the inverter, right? This is a CMOS inverter. This is a very complicated true stable, right? You put in a zero or A and your output becomes a one and vice versa, right? Your Intel chip has probably five million of these circuits in that, right? In running in your laptop. Um, so what we wanted to do, we wanted to manipulate a transistor that we get this functionality, right? That's the, what you see here. No, you don't see it yet here. So, okay. Um, so it's just always one inverter. So the, it, it's not very sophisticated functionally, right? From an inverter that inverts the output, we wanted to, as input, we wanted to have something that always outputs a one. Okay. How do we do that? You see the yellow circle, we look inside the yellow circle. This is kind of a cross-section of a transistor. This is how a transistor core um, uh, looks like. This is uh, silicon. And this is not to scale, right? In reality, they are smaller. You know that, OK? This is, when we talk about 22 nanometers, this is, is what it says gauge, right? This is not 80 centimeters big. Um, this is a normal PMOS transistor. And you have this P-doped wells, as they're called. And what we did is we just do an N-doping on that. Is it difficult? No, because half of your 100 million transistors are N-doped anyway on your device. So we just swap the doping, everything, the standard processes. If you do that, what you see what happening on the, on the top there, or on this top here, you get a straight connection. So it's not a switch anymore, it's a connection. And you can do something similar to the bottom so that you end up within open switch. So this is a permanently closed transistor, and then the end most transistor becomes permanently open. How do you change the doping? Maybe I should go back for the, you know, you remember your, your whatever digital electronic circuit class 101. We change the atoms, right? This is changing of atoms. And by the way, they're not colored in real world, right? So the, the <laughs> key, they're not, you know, it's not opening, they're not orange and green, right? They're stupid atoms, right? And, and, and with very low density. So this is pretty hard to see. You can't see that. That's what I'm trying to say. OK. So yeah, and this is a functionality here, right? Where was it? Yeah, right. So it's always one. Again, so the changes are you know, very atomic. And then the functionality changes are not exactly bre breathtaking either, right? You have not always one <laughs> wire, if you wish, right? So now we, we, um, if you do that, there are two big questions, research questions. First of all, can that be detected, right? This is always the case if you do Trojans, right? And then the uh, other question is probably the bigger question, what can we do with that? You know, how can, can, how can we build a useful Trojan from this you know, pretty simple alteration? So first the question, can we detect that? So here you have two inverters, and now the, my question to you, which one contains the Trojans, right? 
We used to send pictures and we won't be able to see that anyway. <laughs> you wouldn't, right? Because it would be way underneath. And again, we're just swapping a few atoms. So, you know, we, we made that up, right? So they would look exactly the same. But this is somebody from like a government agency or a consumer electronic or car electronic company. When you start delayering, they would look exactly the same, the transistor. This is what I'm, I'm trying to show here. Okay. So, and uh, again, you know, metal layers, polysilicon layers, uh, active areas, well, they all look the same. So that's the same. So, and then, you know, our, our assumption is, our hope is that this will be, in fact, be hard to detect. So now we come to this question number two. The small remaining question is, what we really did, if you have a, a little bit of background in hardware design, um, you will see that we designed a circuit that will not function correctly, right? Because you expect an inverter, and now we, 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 we force this output of the inverter to one. This is what's called a stuck at one fault. So this is like your, your first class in, in VLSI testing. You learn that on day number one, right? It's 300 level course at, at NYU or whatever at UMass. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a you know, simple stuck, a stack at, uh, um, stuck at fault. Um, and what, what you always do in VLSI manufacturing, you have to do a testing, right? Once you build a new Intel chip at the end of the conveyor belt, so to speak, this chip is intensively tested. This chip would be immediately detected and thrown out. So, so now the big question is how can we build a meaningful Trojan from here? This also passes this functional testing. So otherwise you build this Trojan and the chip is, you know, thrown to the trash can at the end of the conveyor belt. And then we were really happy, really lucky because Intel published the design of the true random number generator. You know, every modern Intel chip has this TRNG on board. Why do, what do they do? And what, what we want to do, you know, we assume in somewhere inside there's this uh, true random number generator and we, we um, uh, implement this dope and Trojan. What do people do? People that own laptops say with uh, random number generators, things such as e-banking, right? If you use SSL at some point, somebody has to generate a session key um, and use that for secure web browsing, email encryption, digital signatures, blah, 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 all kind of your standard internet security functionality very, very often relies on a, a, a cryptographic session key, which, which uh, one of the two parties has to generate. Okay. So let's look, look, let's look a little bit more into this design of the random number generator. There are two parts of it, and, and, and pretty much all modern random number generators are designed that way, namely you have this entropy source, and this is what most people think, this is random number generator, this is some kind of analog circuit, right? So you pun, you, 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 you produce random zeros and ones. Typically, people don't fully trust them. Maybe they're not fast enough, maybe they're sensitive against temperature or aging. So as a second part, and this is a little bit blown up here, this is everything else that you see here. This is the fancy term for that is digital pulse processing. And it's very simple. You can think about it as a hash function. The uh, Intel uses AES for that. And what you see, you have the state register up here um, for the key. So you, you um, have a key as input, but also the input input, you know, where you normally put in the plain text. And now the entropy source, generates like crazy zeros and ones and fills false registers, okay? The advantage of that is even if you, oh yeah, and what, what, what pops out here at the other end is the crypto key, so to speak. If you want to have a lot of crypto key or a lot of true random numbers, this might not be fast enough, and then this essentially runs as a stream cipher by just incrementing this. You know, this is very fast. Even if the entropy source is not fast enough, this is very fast, so you have you can, can view that as a, a random number coming in, and that's somewhat as a stream cipher, or, yeah, I think it's like, like, a, like a, a stream cipher or a hash function with feedback. Okay. So, um, and what you can see here, this AES is fed with 256 random bits. That means um, the number of possible crypto keys is 2 to the 256, which is, you know, lifetime of the universe, if you want to brute force it. There are many keys, that's kind of what we expect. And that's, in, in general, this is a very sound design, well done from Intel. What we now, and now we start talking about the, the uh, Trojan. So what we do, we still, you know, we, we look at this register and everything that you see in red here are not a fixed 
affixed to a, a, a specific value which is chosen by the attackers. So all these registers, all the registers don't act as registers anymore, but we, we do this, this um, inverter type of change and we assign a fixed value to this register. So let's say the first one here, if the, TR, if, if the, two random, uh, if the entropy source tries to write a one in here, you never store one, it's always set to zeros, right? And all the red values are chosen by the attacker and the attacker knows that. The only thing that we do is we keep some bits, you know, and kind of a nice example is 32 bits. We keep 32 bits are still actually filled by the true random number source, so there's still two to the 32 possible values here. What that means is only these 32 bits change, all the other 224 bits are the same, so instead of 2 to, two to the 256 possible crypto keys that you see down here, we go down to 232. We, we have about 1 million possible crypto keys. If you want to brute force them, that takes you a few seconds on your laptop, right? Which is kind of an interesting design. So there's still, it's, it's not that you only have one SSL session with one key. You still have 1 billion different keys for your SSL session. That means normally in the lifetime of a user, they will not necessarily... Uh, um, repeat here, right? So it's, and if, if you believe that AS is secure, it's also very hard to detect that, that there is a Trojan built in here. Okay. Um, so th we still have one problem to overcome. I mean, you can do that, but if you would, if, if, if Intel tests, tests the chip, they should be able to detect that, right? Because these are all set to zero. And now is a, one very peculiar uh, um, uh, design, how they, how they do testing, namely to so called so-called um, built-in self-test. It's not very sophisticated in a standard practice in VLSI design. They do, uh, they um, have a self-built, uh, um, um, built-in self-test, how does it work? So this is this AES call that we looked, uh, uh, looked at before. How that works is, for, for testing, whether everything works correctly, there's a known input. Um, the known input is uh, put in here and you generate 512 random bits. And if you would do a um, check these 512 bits, yeah, right. so you would get the incorrect results because the known inputs will not be accepted, remember? You know, yeah, because we have been set to all these red values and these are not, not the values that are being used by the self-test, right? So that would fail. That means the 512 bits that, we, that you get out at the self-test after introducing the Trojan would be incorrect. But they're not checking all 512 bits. They do a compression, if you wish, with a CRC checksum, and you get these 32 bits out here, right? And what they do is, they Intel, inside the Intel chip, they only look whether these 32 bits are correct or not. So what we could do now, so this is now the Trojan version. This is a manipulated one. And again, these 512 bits don't match. You get the, you get the wrong results because we introduced the Trojan. Um, but what we can do is we can make sure that these 32 bits match. So even though we have the Trojan here, we compute the wrong values. After compression, we still get the correct values. How does this work? It's just basic linear algebra because we know we can choose these 220, what was it, 226 bits that we manipulate we can choose them such that the 32 bit of the CRC checks them is still correct. So that was great. So it worked. Um, and it was this great Trojan that we uh, designed and we published that at Chess 2013, I believe. We got a huge amount of press on that. You know, that was a few months after Edward Snowden had gone public. Um, and I think the big lesson learned is we can build meaningful hardware Trojans and meaningful from an attacker's, right, from a bad guy's point of view without using any extra logic, right? We just changed the doping. So this was really cool. Um, a lot of the detection techniques will totally fail with what we do here, right? So it will totally fail. You can, I'm, I'm not saying we cannot detect that. I'm going to talk about that in, in, in 30 seconds. Um, this built-in self-test is a dangerous thing to do. And, and again, all the details can be found in our uh, CHESS 2013 paper. Um, what is really interesting, we got, you know, most people thought it was really cool, and some people from industry think it's completely irresponsible that we talk about this stuff, right? Yeah, why, why do you do that? You know, now you teach the bad guys how to build sneaky Trojans. 
But as we all know, everybody in this room knows that we do that to show weaknesses and hopefully fix the weaknesses. And I have to say the scientific community did his homework because just one year later, uh, um, a group of really uh, great researchers from Japan came out and showed, well, you know what Christo was saying, we just changed the doping and nobody can see that. This is not quite true, actually. You can see that with a scanning electron microscope. It's still a pain in the neck and takes some time, but you can do that. I'm not particularly good with material science. My, my, my gut feeling is my assumption is if this is a realistic threat, people probably can come up with other detection methods which are quite efficient, right? What, I'm try what we are trying to do with this research, this is a real threat. We should be able to look at the threat, deal with that, and yeah, there will probably be countermeasures that are effective. So now I come to the um, uh, next case study uh, related to hardware Trojan FPGA Trojans. What are FPGAs? FPGAs are field programmable, field programmable gate arrays, so these are reconfigurable hardware devices, and they're widely used. It's a small part of the overall VLSI market, I don't know, maybe a percent or something like that, but the total number of devices is huge, right? Currently, we, the, the uh, FPGA companies sell a few billion devices per year, so it's a pretty big market, and they tend to come up not in, in, in very cheap consumer electronic ones, but kind of in, in very valuable type of devices and a lot of mission critical type of devices, right? Military, medical technology, um, network routers. And a lot of them run crypto, as we know, okay? So if you're not familiar with, with uh, FPGAs, it's kind of surprising how they work. It's just a tiny little thing how they work, namely, so, these are the two market leaders, right? Xilinx and Altera, they have together between 80 and 90% of the world's market um, in, in FPGAs. Um, you can configure them, so you can, can view them as devices consisting of something like 1 million gates. If you buy them, you know, if, if, if you go to Walmart and buy them, you don't buy them at Walmart, right? If you go to your favorite hardware supplier, buy these chips, you're that dumb. You have 1 million gates, but you have to configure them. They're configured with software. That's the beauty of it. But... Small, interesting fact, the software is always in an external flash. This is purely technological reasons. They have problems maintaining the software inside the chip here, putting this flash memory on the chip. So these are flashless, memoryless chips. How do you get that in? Well, upon power up. So every time you power up your, your um, Cisco router, there's this bit stream loaded in, and the bit stream consists of a few 10 million bits here, right? And then the 10 million bits configure all the little gates. Um, and what, what are we going to do uh, with this attack? So we, we try to manipulate the crypto. So if this AS inside, somehow AS is encoded he, in, in here, it will eventually show up in your Xilinx or Altera chips. It means there's an AS functionality in your network router for doing SSL network encryption, for instance. Okay. So what Pavel and I thought a few years ago um, if you want to build a hardware Trojan, unlike Intel, you know, we never built that. You know, Intel would never agree. Uh, Intel hates us, right, for the work we did before. So they will never agree to build a, you know, t um, um, random number generator Trojan just for us, right, to get a better paper. But here it's very different because, in, at least in theory, we can manipulate this flash file here, right? So, and now the question is, can we maybe build a more realistic hardware Trojan by manipulating these bit streams here? Um, so what would be the setup? So we have this file here, right? The file somehow describes the inside of the architecture. And the problem is this architecture is, is very, very complicated. At the heart of, yeah, part of the heart, you know, an important component are these so-called LUTs lookup table. These lookup tables, they are uh, four, five, or six input lookup tables, one output. They are used for realizing Boolean functions. So you don't have explicit gates. There's no X or gates, there's no AND or gate. You always have the lookup tables, and the lookup tables can realize certain Boolean functions here. So if you look now at certain bits, somewhere in the bit stream, we don't know where are the contents of this lookup table. That means this describes a, a Boolean gate here. So the general idea is we manipulate the bits. For instance, you know, we're replacing two bits by these red bits here. Um, and then we configure. And if the original bit stream, the original flash, you know, that's residing on the printed circuit board inside your, 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 your Cisco router, has AS inside, and now we start manipulating what will happen. 
you won't have AS anymore in your Altera chip, but this AST, right, which stands for Trojan. So that's kind of, that's this, you know, as far as I can use um, PowerPoint, right? So you won't have the original AS, but you have somehow a manipulated version of AS on board. Okay, so this is, this is the basic idea. What, AST, yeah, yeah, should get a trademark on that, right? <laughs> okay, so um, now let's look, so, you know, the basic concept is not that complicated, right? Now let's look at the mechanics of that, right? The details, how do we actually do that? And it was a lot of work, right? You, you, you know, is a PhD student does that for a year or one and a half years to do what I'm going to present on one slide here. So given is that you have AS inside, the problem is, we have no idea where AES is in here, right? This is big file, you know, millions of bits. Um, it configures, you know, the, the number of logic cells there in the you know, thousands or millions. Um, and the part that is really hard, which bits configure which part of this, fa or what they call fabric, is unknown. This is proprietary and exiling, so they are really are really protective as then they're not talking about that. There has not been a lot of reverse engineering happening. So now the challenge is, is uh, first finding AES. You know, where is AES here? And this is probably only a small fraction of the overall design. You have this big, big file, some of this AES. And then once you found it, how can we manipulate that? Um, and we were, we, were, we were lucky for one reason, namely the... Um, S boxes in AS, right? S boxes at the very heart of AS, um, they are stored in these small lookup tables. This is the first thing we were lucky. And in general, this is unknown what's happening here. Even the lookup tables are unknown, but they're easy to find. Easy means it took Pavel, whatever, nine months to find them, right? So with, with trial and error, you can find them. Um, meaning we find the S box. We, we, we know where the lookup tables are, and there are many. I think there are around 30,000 lookup tables in that, right? And then the other thing where we're really lucky is the um, contents of the S-Box is very, very, very specific, and it has to do with this crypto cryptographic functionality. You need this really high degree of nonlinearity. And these specific contents, this specific Boolean function is realized by the S-Box, you will never see in any other digital design. This is completely pathological, right? You only need that for crypto. You know, if you build a state machine, if you build an MP3 decoder, if you build whatever in an FPGA, the specific contents that you need for an S box will not show up. Odds are extremely small, right? So they're very specific contents. Um, and again, this has to do with the, you know, in, in order to protect against linear cryptanalysis and differential cryptanalysis. Okay. So... Um, the first thing that we did, we uh, got eight real-world AS implementation from the internet, and actually we bought hardware that had AS on board. We didn't know the design, so the first question is, can we actually detect that? And, uh, you know, these are the implementations, one to eight, and what you see here, this is the only thing that's important to you. Yeah, we found every single time we were able to find the AS S boxes, and that even though they were fairly complex designs, we didn't know anything else that's running on this FPGA but just checking the, uh, checking the lookup tables, looking for the S-boxes, we found them. And now we come to the actual attack that we performed. Um, so now we know there's AS on board, we found the S-boxes, but we can't do much else about it. We, we don't know anything else about the, the uh, um, design. For instance, we cannot reroute the key out with the key because we don't know where the key is active. We just have this tiny little in a part of AES. So um, and we did something relatively simple, namely once we found the S boxes, we can swap the original S boxes with weak S boxes. Weak S boxes can be all one, right? Every time you evoke AES, you get all one, or it's the input is equal to the output, right? So you don't have the strong nonlinearity. You, you design a laughably weak version of AES, and this is easy to do because we found the S boxes. Um, so the, the general strategy is we take our target, right, Cisco router, we find the flash chip, we swap the S boxes, and if you do that, you, you configure your, a, um, your, your FPGA not with AES, but the tro Trojan version of AES, right? So you have now a weak AES configured. If you do that, if you send a plain text to your AES board, 
get a ciphertext back, but not with AES, but with the Trojanized version of AES, right? So this is kind of cute, but you know, if you know a little bit about digital systems, this is also very stupid, right? Because you don't have the original AES running, it's not interoperable, right? If Alice and Bob want to talk, if you encrypt that way, you get the incor incorrect ciphertext out, Bob won't be able to decrypt that anymore. So it's, it's pretty, pretty limited what you can do here, right? But it's doable, that's the thing. You know, again, it took Pavel 18 months to get to this slide here, right? So now our question is, what can we do from that? Is it of any use? And surprisingly, yeah, there are at least two attacks possible, which we think are fairly valid and a little scary. One useful attack, this is probably the more, I don't know, it's not the, the, the most scary, I think, is storage encryption. If you do storage encryption, you don't have Alice and Bob, you only have Alice, right? Alice writes to the hard, to the hard disk, and Alice reads back. With this attack, this is great, right? You, you swap the original S-Box with the weak S-Box. That means Alice is reading and writing in an encrypted way. With a small drawback, it's really weakly encrypted. That means now if the German NSA gets access to your hard disk or your, to, to your cloud uh, uh, partitioning, they can read out the ciphertext. This is being stored in the cloud, and it's really easy to break. Right, this is, is breaking with weak aspects is very easy, right? Or we actually did one um, with a uh, uh, USB stick. Actually, we, we did that. We opened the, the high-end USB sticks that use AES encryption with FPGAs. That's another paper that we have on that. Um, and we did that. So we, we, we replaced the S boxes on this USB stick. And uh, we were able to, you know, uh, force the USB stick to use really weak encryption. And it's really hard to detect. The other attack which is maybe a little bit more far-fetched, but might still work. This is in a situation where you want to get, um, you have a device with a key hidden, and um, you want to get the key out, right? Maybe the key is derived from a path. So what you can do, you need temporary access to the device, you need temporary access to your Cisco router. What you do, and, and you want to learn the key. So what you can do is, again, you swap the S boxes, and this takes a second. This is just changing the flash context. You power your device up. Um, you provide plain text. You get ciphertext back. And again, you can break the ciphertext. You can extract the key. And you've learned the key. Or you've learned, for instance, the PUF key that's, or the TP, that's coming from a TPN chip on, on board. Um, you get the key, and then you put the original flash context back. You know, then you, you put the original AES in here. So this is a really convenient way of extracting the key if you have access to the device and it's much easier than side channel, fault injection, or invasive attacks. So what did we learn from here? So in general, this is a new attack vector against FPGAs. And as I mentioned before, people have been working on FPGA and crypto FPGA security since 27 years. I think the first paper was in 1990 from uh, DEC Paris. And nobody looked at, at that before, which is kind of uh, surprising. Um, from a you know, practical point of view, these FPGAs are great for building hardware Trojan because you can actually build them, right? You don't have to convince Intel to put a Trojan in their actual device. Um, and the, over, you know, the, the, the over, uh, overarching problem is that this bitstream is not protected here. So that was the um, uh, uh, earlier paper from us. And uh, this attack is described in, in uh, um, IEEE transaction on CAT in 2015. And now I come to the last part of my talk, which is also the shortest. I want to talk about a brand new attack, which I think is really cool. Okay. So, so um, what we've seen here before, right, by manipulating bit streams, by manipulating this flash here, which configures this FPGA, we can build Trojans. So the next question we ask ourselves, can we do more Classical crypto attacks, attacks where we ju just want to extract the key. Um, and again, we look at, at AES here. So let's look at the setting. This is your Cisco router. There is an unknown key. Um, what we can do as attacker, we can provide plain text. We can observe cipher text. And now we're not talking about Trojans, right? We run the original AES. Just the question, how, how can we get the key out? So this is classical non-plain text and yeah, non-plain text, non-cipher text setting. What is non-classical, what is new here, we can also alter the bitstream, right? And the question is, is this of any use for an attacker? And um, 
That's a question here, right? But this additional you know, degree of freedom as an attacker that we can somehow manipulate AES, can we do that? And now the important thing is if you have total control over that, if you do complete reverse engineering, which nobody has ever done with Rising's Altera, it would be easy. So the question is, we essentially have no proprietary knowledge about this here, very limited about the flash contents here. Can we exploit that? And now is the, um, this is a new attack, which we call beefy bitstream fault injection attack, which is kind of interesting what happened, right? So this is really, I was really surprised that it works. So what we do know is the lots. We don't know the, we, we, uh, don't know the functionality, and we know there are a few 10,000 lookup tables in here. We know where they're located, but we don't know which role they play in your AES design. And by the way, this is not all running AES. It's running all kind of other functionality, OK? Um, here's a surprising attack strategy that it works, and we were just doing plain, uh, uh, um, uh, trial and error. So the attack works as follows. You have this, whatever, let's say 30, 30, 10,000, it's easier to talk about, 10,000 LUTs, right? So what you do is you look at the first LUT, and there's some contents, you don't care what it is, you set it to all zero, for instance, right? You just override it. Now you configure your, your FPGA, you power up, you send plain text, you get ciphertext back, okay? With this unknown key, that's why I put that red, right? And now this is a weird thing. You look at the ciphertext, and what we are looking at, I don't know if you can read that, does the ciphertext somehow contain the key? That wouldn't make any sense, right? We look, is there a key contained in that? And I'm, I'm going to talk on the next slide what I mean with contained, right? The surprising answer is this is going to be successful sooner or later. Normally not with the first lookup table, right? It doesn't work with the first lookup table. And this process, you know, one loop takes about three seconds to do, right? Typically, you get some kind of incorrect ciphertext out and you throw it away. So what we do then, we go to the second lookup table. You know, the first one is again uh, configured correctly. Now we overwrite the second lookup table. We configure the device, blah, 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 another three seconds. And you, they're not millions, they're 10,000, for instance. And um, so what happens is it leaks. It, sometimes it actually leaks directly. That means the ciphertext is the key. What is much more common is that the ciphertext is one of the round keys. The ciphertext can also be the inverted round key. The ciphertext can be the plain text X or with the round key. And we did a lot of experiments. It turned out, as we call it uh, a leakage hypothesis. I think we had 16 different ones, right? And one of them worked for at least one of, the, at least one of them worked for every design, right? So this always worked. Um, what was also interesting is um, how we did the manipulation, that matters. So, you know, the obvious one is all, ze all zero, all one. Sometimes inverting helped. Sometimes we looked at the um, uh, um, lookup tables. There, there are 64-bit um, uh, um, large, 64-bit entries. So we only manipulated the upper part, or only the lower part. Okay. What are the results for that? So... This time we didn't take eight, but 16 unknown AES designs from the internet or that we actually bought on hardware boards, right? We had 16 different manipulation rules where we overwrote the LUT contents. And again, there were about 20,000 LUTs per, um, per design. And as I mentioned before, that's about three seconds for checking one of these alterations, which is mainly the time for powering the device up. So the really surprising result is every single of the 16 hardware boards, we could actually extract the key. So we had 100% success rate with that, which is really interesting. Um, on average, it took about 2,000 configurations. So your mouth, it was like 1,973 or so times three seconds, you end about with two hours. So it took us about two hours, about 2,000 power ups on average per design um, to get the key out. And what is maybe the most scary part of that, there is... Um, you have the option to encrypt the flash, you know, this uh, um, connection between flash and um, FPGA can be encrypted. That means you don't have the plain design here, but you have an encrypted design. So this is not the plain content, this is the encrypted content. We ran the same attack and it still works. 
this is really scary. So what they do, they do, which you know, what you learn in my Crypto 101 course, our first semester course in, in Bochum is never do just encryption, also do use Max, right, to integrity checks. They don't use integrity check on that and the attack is still possible. So it's a really nice example when plain uh, encryption is not enough. So conclusion from that is um, this is a new family of attack. And again, people have been working, including, you know, including myself, we've been working on it for 20, 25 years. Nobody looked at that, you know, what happens if you manipulate the design? Um, and the big picture answer is a bitstream is malleable, right? So you can alter the bitstream and see what's happening. And this is a really bad thing in crypto. Um, I'm pretty sure there are other bitstream based attacks, right? This is just the first one we published. And this is an upcoming paper on the uh, transaction on computers. Okay, so there are, I think, the two final slides or three final slides. If you really liked the work, Ahmad was very generous and mentioned chess, which has become a really big conference. This is, uh, chess is alter, alternating between Europe, US, and Asia. And this year it's, it's Asia time, so it will be Taiwan. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a really fun conference. Um, Ross is two other conferences that I'm involved with, which I think is, is maybe interesting to the audience here. Uh, Ross is, is uh, going to give an extremely interesting talk later today on hardware security. And there um, is an old established conference. Um, maybe we started with SK Europe in 2013, and, and Ross gave the first keynote there in, in 2013 in Cologne. So if you're interested in this very specific topic of embedded security in the contents of CAR, I recommend these two conferences. Um, one advertisement slide if you're interested in applied crypto, buy my book, or even better, you don't have to buy my book because everything's on YouTube for free, right? So there's 20, 24 lectures on uh, introduction to cryptography, which is our freshman course, which is uh, quite popular at YouTube. Thank you very much. There's a question. Uh, hello. Uh, right. uh, nice talk. <laughs> for, the, for the first set of attacks, so, uh, so what you were exploiting for the random number generator is really perhaps some non-deterministic Boolean function. But if it's a deterministic Boolean, and I guess that's quite special, right? So for a deterministic Boolean function, would there be a useful attack? Can you repeat your question? So, so, so what you showed for the random circuit, it's, uh, not, let me say, a non-deterministic Boolean function. Right, right. right. But most of the circuit, sorry, most of the chip functionality is on deterministic Boolean functions. Yeah. Right, so would that kind of attack help? Yeah, I mean, you would need a different type of attack, and this is similar to maybe what we did with AES. I think in, in uh, general, if you have this deterministic, we, 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 did, we, we did some work on stream type, which is going in, in this direction. I think you, you can do similar type of attacks too. I mean, once you start changing the Boolean function, you change, let's say, the space in which your, your hash function is Uh, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Just uh, you point out uh, about the encrypted uh, uh, bit stream. Uh, can you tell us, uh, tell more about that? What 